Thank you very much for inviting me for a really warm and wonderful introduction. Of course, my goal is to introduce you to the study of aging, and I certainly do not pretend to uh, give you the summa theologica of everything that is going on in this period. I think that uh, the science of aging and the interest and enthusiasm about to the studying aging is expanding tremendously. What I can tell you is that uh, when I was, was going to a party 10 or 15 years ago, and people were asking me what I was doing, I will say, well, I'm studying aging, and suddenly everybody has something that they had to do immediately. And they needed a drink, they needed to go, they needed to talk with somebody else. But I can tell you, this has changed. I mean, I now do it to a party. I say, I am a geriatrician, I study aging, and I am at the center and the focus of the attention. Everybody is starting to understand how understanding aging and studying aging is so important. And that's why I wanted to start with this slide. <laughs> and this slide is uh, from a, the New York Times website of a couple of years ago, where this photograph had uh, encountered uh, this uh, yoga teacher and uh, did a photographic show in and, 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 and Central Park with this 93 years old uh, yoga master. And you can tell that uh, she's unbelievable. I have to tell you that uh, Every Saturday morning, except this week, I religiously go to yoga and Pilates. And I really think that is fantastic, uh, but I'm never going to be able to do what she does. It's just impossible. I tell you that uh, the limit of the human science, uh, it's very far from it reach its ceiling. And so we can do a lot more than we can do now if we only find the secret of the healthy aging. That's why I'm so enthusiastic about this field. And a uh, few years ago, I was asked the question, how do you define aging? How do we know what aging is? How if I see a person in the room, you know, some of you, I can tell them that you're 65, you're 53, you're 45, or 94. And, you know, I don't know whether you have seen the recent uh, picture of Isabella Rossellini uh, in, 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 and at age 62, she looks like 28, and it's unbelievable. And so, while looking at the person, you're not going to be able to see how old this, this person is. Uh, and you should not be feeling too bad because scientists don't do much better than that. And in fact, even by using very sophisticated biomarkers, you know, recently we do better with epigenetic, but before that, we were really doing very, very badly in estimating the age of an individual. So one thing that I wanted to do is to try to define the aging phenotype. And defining the aging phenotype, it's a really, really important goal. It's incredibly important. If you go to the website now and to the internet, you'll find so many websites that tell you that they can slow down aging, they can reverse aging, they can do something about aging. But the bottom line is that nobody can measure aging now. So I don't know how they're going to demonstrate that they're reversing aging or slowing down aging if they don't know what aging is and how they can demonstrate that. So in order to do that, to be able to have an aging phenotype, I went back to the epidemiology. And uh, you know, in epidemiological study, especially in the large longitudinal study, you can study a trait in a specific individual and trying to understand what are the traits that change in everybody. I'm not saying that something that tend to change or more likely to change, those things that change on every aging individual. You know, for example, creating clearance. In the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Asia, there is no one person that longitudinally does not decline in creatinine clearance. If you look at lean body mass, there is absolutely nobody that increased lean body mass when you look at them over 20 years follow-up. So if you, I, I was collecting them, putting them, writing them on post it and then pour, assembling them on a the table. And then, I closed the door of my office and I said, until I come up with categories of those post-it and I can group them in domains, I'm not going to get out. 
And, you know, I stared at them for a very, very long time, and until I was able to really group them in four domains. And that's how the domains came up. And there are the changes in body composition, the energy imbalance, uh, the homeostatic dysregulation, and neurodegeneration. I can tell you that this is simple, four domains, a very simple slide, but in the way I conceptualize aging and I do my analysis and also work and think about patients, uh, this scheme completely changed my mind. And I'll give you an example. When I was a geriatrician, I was already doing work on frailty. And I was enthusiastic about the paper that I was publishing. And uh, I couldn't really understand how to insert that wonderful, extraordinary interest in science into the care of my patients. You know, when I was in front of my patients, they had hypertension, they had cholesterol, they were obese. How did I put the frailty concept into the care of this individual? I did not know, and I was still using the medical model, treating a specific disease. Now, if you look at this, uh, then things can change, because to see those domains are actually the interface by which disease affect physical and cognitive decline in older people. So, and you can think about them as being common interface where disease and aging as a process, the biological process, really collapse into a unique um, pathway that lead to those uh, uh, bad outcomes. And, and then you still you start looking at, at, at disease in a different way. You know, the diabetes is no longer the disease that affects the glucose. Yes, it is, of course, is a carbohydrate metabolism, but it's also the disease that affects body composition, energy imbalance, homeostatic dysregulation, neurodegeneration. And you start discovering that those with diabetes have accelerated the decline of muscle mass, and that uh, you start understanding why disease has impact on all the four aging phenotype domains uh, have the largest, uh, have the strongest correlation with the frailty and with the geriatric syndrome. Also, what geriatrician call the geriatric syndrome, the condition that cannot really be defined otherwise, such as urinary incontinence, cannot be interpreted as part of the domains. In fact, urinary incontinence is sarcopenia, change in body composition because of the change in the uh, pelvic muscle, and can be interpreted as neurodegeneration because it's the degeneration of the nerves that serve the bladder. And so that <coughs> by looking at this domain, you have a key of interpretation and a point of aggression for those diseases and conditions that affect all the people. Okay, I'm gonna go try to go through this quickly, but uh, I can tell you that I have much more slide than I can show, so we'll see where I can get. The first domain I wanna talk to you about uh, is muscle, is uh, the body composition changes. And one criterion that we had a long time ago was the idea that uh, Body composition change with aging. There is a decline in lean body mass because there is a decline in lean body mass. There is also a decline in strength, and so we need to aggressively address um, the decline in lean body mass. The problem is that uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. So if you look at decade, and these are longitudinal decline in different cohorts in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, the decline in uh, is isokinetic torque, which is a measure of strength, is much faster and over and beyond was expected by the decline in mass, which here is measured as uh, CT muscle cross-sectional area at the middle thigh suggesting that there is decline that occur in muscle quality. So measuring strength and measuring mass by itself don't really tell you the entire story. We need to start focusing on muscle quality. In fact, 
If you look at the A measure of muscle quality, I, we still don't have a gold standard, but probably the best measure is the ratio between mass and strength, strength and mass. And you look at this ratio, cross-sectionally over the uh, a very wide range, age range in the BLSA, there is a decline in men and in women that is very clear. Okay, is this important? Because, I mean, if this is a curiosity, and you know, it's fine, we can write an article on it, but uh, the most important thing is understanding whether this is important for people. So in order to see whether this is important, I use a different display of the data. So I look at, uh, on the x-axis, uh, you see that there is a measure of force. That is, you know, functionally the most important measure we have. And on the y-axis, you have a measure of quality. The red dots are the people who walk at the speed of 0 0.8 meters per second. And, uh, you know, you need to know that 0 0.8 meters per second is like that. So if you look at that, there is certainly a strong correlation that you can see between mass and the measure of force and the measure of quality. But if I superimpose the cross, that to help you read in the data, you can see that uh, there is a lot of people, a large chunk of people that in the blue uh, area, that in spite of the low strength, uh, because they have good muscle quality, they show no disability. They're still walking at the speed that is higher than 0 0.8 meters per second. So strength uh, by itself is not sufficient to define who is going to lose function. But those with low muscle quality, independent of their strength and mass, will be those that will eventually decline in function. We can discuss that later. And there's a number of things that we are investigating. You can look at that from different perspectives. And we are exploring a number of areas. We are, for example, looking at the neuromuscle of function by using biomarkers and biopsies. We are looking at the movement of calcium within the muscle. For example, looking at the oxidation and nitrosylation of the ryanodine receptors. We are looking at energy, the energy generated by mitochondria, and we can now measure this energy very well by using MRI phosphoro P31 spectroscopy, and we're doing this in the large population. And we are also looking at uh, using electron microscopy to the structure of the sarcoma because the stoichiometric ratio between uh, the different proteins that constitute the contractile area seems to change with aging, and we are finding few, few small changes. And, and of course, this area of investigation is going to be extremely important in the future. OK, from muscle, I need to transition to fat, because uh, in the introduction, we have seen how this is important. And, uh, what we find is that especially midlife obesity is a very, very, very strong predictor of important outcomes. So on the left, what we did was to take people that the age of 70 had low, I think it's 70, I don't remember, to be 60 and 70. We divided among those with good muscle quality and low muscle quality. And we found that there was a small difference in weight, but then when you adjust for other variables, really the weight at the time of measure was not very important. But then we look at them retrospectively, what happened to these people over the previous year. And those who developed <coughs> low muscle quality were those that over the years have gained weight. So gaining weight, is what really affects the muscle. It's not being overweight. And in fact, those with good muscle area were actually slightly overweight already in their young age. So maintaining a stable weight seems to be the healthy way of also maintaining good muscle. And on the right, I'll show you that a recent analysis that was done by Madhav Tambisetti in our group and by um, Susan Resnick and show that uh, the obesity at uh, you know, high BMI at the age of 50 
is a predictor not only of cognitive decline, but the age of onset of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, we also have a large percentage of our individuals who do an autopsy. So we have pathology in the brain. So we were able to correlate uh, the pathology in the brain indicate the indicative of Alzheimer's disease with their BMI at age 50 and demonstrated that uh, the BMI at age 50 was substantially correlated with the severity of pathology after death. So we're still doing that analysis to do the functional implication of that, but that tells you that you know, you're talking about variables that are absolutely measure with precision because when you do autopsy, you know, you can't really keep with those data. Okay. What are the agent changes in energetic cause disability in older person? And I know that I don't have very much time, but this is for me the area that is the most promising. And I also always introduce this area thinking that the energy you have during the day for 24 hours is like a big box that is given to you every morning. And then you have to use that uh, because if you don't conserve that up to the next morning, you're going to die. You need that energy to stay alive. And in fact, 70% of all the energy we consume, between 60 and 70, depending, it's really used for uh, stay alive. It's the resting metabolic rate. The problem is that most of the studies that have been done in the resting metabolic rate area have been done in young, healthy individuals. And when you start studying people that have disease and disability, you find that that 70% is absolutely underestimation of the real necessity. When you have a disease, you need the energy to fight disease. If you have an infection, you need to synthesize antibodies. And antibody synthesis is protein. Protein synthesis is unbelievably expensive. So you're going to deal with an extra load of energy required. In fact, we demonstrated that in those with chronic inflammation, the requirement from protein intake increased tremendously to maintain the same muscle mass over the years. There's also another issue that is happening with aging, is that uh, people become less efficient. In order to do the same task, uh, they need more energy. And because of that, uh, they need more energy to stay alive, they need more energy to do the basic stuff, and so in the end, uh, they have very little energy uh, uh, to do anything else. And we can see this when we look at behaviors of people, where in older people, especially those that are ill or disabled, you see that they move at burst. You know, they do an activity for 10 minutes and then they need to rest. Other 10 minutes, they need to rest. If you look at your old parents or grandparents, you will see that the total amount of activity in a day may not be substantially different but the pattern of activity, which is interrupted by many, many little periods of rest, is substantially different. Okay, these are data that were published by the DLSA a few years ago, showing that uh, fitness declined with aging. But these, uh, actually I'm gonna skip these slides. These were uh, a study that uh, I did when I came to NIA in 2002 and 2003. Somebody much cleverer than me, 30 years before, had been measuring resting metabolic rate in the BLSA. And you know, it's extraordinarily interesting to see how they did that. They were collecting air with large balloon of plastic and then measuring the composition of air by using a method that's called the Aldane method, which is incredibly complicated. And so when I look at those data, I thought, my God, we are never going to get anything from this. And also my theory was that because the resting metabolic rate change with aging decline, those with the low resting metabolic rate will have a higher mortality. I was absolutely wrong. And in fact, high resting metabolic rate, higher than expected, is actually a strong predictor of mortality. And was such a strong predictor of mortality that the split between those who died and those who survived, which is the red and the blue 
uh, area in the different cohorts occur 10 to 15 years prior to that, at the time when their disease was not even clinically evident, showing that the excess use of energy is really an early marker of disease deterioration that is not used clinically yet, but if we could develop standard of reference, could be one of the most interesting markers of global decline in health in older people. And so we look at, uh, this is a cross-sectional analysis showing that the decline in resting metabolic rate occurred in men and women, and is partially, but not completely explained by change in, uh, in um, lean body mass. But uh, these are, I wanna show you two slides. One is, uh, when we look at people with accelerated decline of uh, function across multiple physiological domains, uh, we found that, that uh, compared to the other people, they tended to have across the lifespan a high resting metabolic rate and not a low resting metabolic rate. Uh, again, suggested the high resting metabolic rate, high energy consumption at rest is a strong predictor of that outcome. And this is just an analysis that Jennifer Schra just gave me. This is an unpublished work showing that if you look at uh, efficiency, low cost of walking versus high cost of walking, this is a strong longitudinal predictor of losing the ability to walk, of uh, developing a functional limitation. So not only it is associated with it, but in people that still don't have functional limitation, predict functional limitation. And again, well, well let me, let me, good. You know, this, this is a, it's another analysis just accepted for publication showing that uh, resting metabolic rate is also a strong indicator of comorbidity, which is uh, how many disease you have. And if we look at an autoregressive model, you find that uh, the high resting metabolic rate come before you develop comorbidity. So there is a causal pathway there that seems to be indicating that the resting metabolic rate increased at the early stage. Do I still have a few minutes? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna do um, just a few words on inflammation because uh, I think that inflammation, it, it, it's really an unbelievably important and growing area of interest in aging. So first of all, these are data that are still unpublished uh, showing that uh, when you look at the profile of uh, gene expression, you find that, uh, and this is in one paper, but there are many other papers, both in animal model and human model, they find that uh, the pathway that is most overexpressed of anyone else, uh, it's inflammation. And the one down-regulated, almost in every study is mitochondrial function. So you have low energy and high inflammation. Well, in 1999, uh, with Jack Koralnik and Tamara Harris, we published a paper showing that uh, level of IL-6 in people that were non-disabled predict incident disability. And you know, when I look at the data the first time, I was shocked. And you know, holy cow, these are so interesting and so uh, powerful. And I thought, I have understood what's happening with aging. This is the secret of why all the people lose their ability to walk. And, and of course, you know, I was wrong because uh, there's a lot more complexity than inflammation in aging. But the more we study inflammation, the more we find out that inflammation seems to be pervasive and important across a number of disease and phenotypes of aging. And why is that? Why is so, such a powerful predictor, much more powerful than any other predictor we have had so far? Well, in reality, inflammation is a good guy. I mean, inflammation has been developed uh, uh, because to protect our organism. And we only think about inflammation as protecting ourselves from infection, from traumas. But in fact, uh, the immune system has also other two very, very important uh, functions, which are maintenance and repair. You could not constantly maintain and repair your tissue 
unless you have a very well effective and coordinated inflammatory function. And here, what's happening is that uh, when you have an inflammatory response, for example, after a trauma, because inflammation needs to be dedicated completely to fight that aggression, many of the maintenance uh, and repair uh, activities are shut down. For example, during inflammatory response, we know that absorption of food is reduced, the synthesis of protein in the muscle is downregulated, and uh, the IGF-1, for example, is not only less uh, expressed, but also its biological activity is dampened. There is a stimulation of osteoclast with almost no activity of the osteoblast. The uh, activity of the bone marrow, even when stimulated by erythropoietin, for example, the erythropoietin is less produced, and when it's produced, is less biologically active, less uh, able to produce uh, erythrocytes, and so on. There are many, many other activities that downregulate. Okay, this is fine if you have an acute infection. You, may, you can delay those repair maintenance activity for a few days uh, and nothing is gonna happen to your body. But what happens when you have a dysregulated inflammation that lasts forever? You, the time of maintenance and repair never come. So you have degenerative disease across a large uh, variety of tissues and mechanisms. And when those damage accumulate, when the repair is not done, we know that the consequence can be really, really important. I'm going to skip all of these because I don't have time to show you that. And just to tell you that uh, the aging phenotype model allows us also to do, to try to think about a dream. In 2011, a very important paper was published in the journal Cell, which was called The All Marks of Aging. And the paper described nine very well-defined theories of the aging process. And when I read that paper, I reread it, and I reread it, and I reread it, and I was startled by the fact that none of those theories have ever been addressed and tested in humans. Everything was done in invertebrate, uh, and the mass scenario was done in mice. So how did I know, how do we know that those theories are relevant for the aging process in human? Well, I think that we have now the technology to study and the biomarker that allow us to measure those processes. And if they're true, if they're relevant, they need to be associated with the aging phenotype, which are the interface by which individuals lose physical and cognitive function. So we can start thinking that maybe there is a way by which we can test those hypotheses in human, and those will be the best intervention, the best target for our future intervention and studies, because it's only by slowing down the aging process that we can have a real effect on the comorbidity and the burden of disability that affect older people. This is our website. You're welcome to look into it, the BLSA. And I have to say that there's a new BLSA director. I couldn't be the BLSA director, which is a full-time job, and the um, scientific director, and, but I have a fantastic director, which is Stephanie Studesky, who, should do it, who is doing an incredible job. And we share data with everybody that has a good idea and can present a good idea for us. And uh, of course, I'm here pontificating, but the work is done by a lot more people than me. In fact, I don't do very much work anymore. They do all the work themselves, and these are my collaborators, and I feel really lucky to be working with them. Thank you for your attention.